Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining the webinar this afternoon. This is the last webinar for public health this year, so I hope you enjoy it. We have Dr. Andrew Langley presenting on environmental health risks. Andrew, I'll let you begin your presentation now. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, well, welcome, everybody. I'm Andrew Langley. I've recently retired as the director of the Sunshine Coast Public Health Unit. I've had a long interest in environmental health issues. Um, and during the late 1980s and 1990s, I helped to develop the Australian model um, of environmental health risk assessment. It's another useful tool to have in your armamentarium for dealing with exam questions and the very real environmental health issues you'll have to deal with as a public health physician. I'll just talk a little bit about the history of risk assessment uh, and even concepts of risk um, are only of a few hundred years standing. Uh, there's a very good book called Against the, the Gods uh, by Peter Bernstein, it's referred to, but it talks about um, the interplay of uh, risk assessment and chance and probability that developed from the 1600s on. Um, in more recent times, following World War II, it became apparent that there was a need to appraise some of the risks that we were dealing with. Uh, and particularly from the US, um, a model developed and was published by the United States National Academy of Sciences in 1983. We used that model, which was used extensively for looking at chemical risks, um, but also to a lesser degree, um, radiation risks. Um, and we used that to develop um, the Australian um, in health environmental health risk assessment methodology. It was becoming apparent that we needed uh, a consistent uh, approach that was transparent and for that matter, defensible. Uh, and that was why we sort of formalized um, the process. Initially, it was do, um, dealing with contaminated sites, but it's expanded to environmental health generally. Uh, in the 1990s, Standards Australia um, uh, released its risk management process, and you might be aware of that from your own organisations. It is a risk matrix-based um, system, and um, I feel it has some problems, particularly for dealing with some of the more complex issues we're having to deal with. Um, I'll move on to the next slide. So whilst risk assessment was particularly developed um, to deal with chemical and radiation risks, um, where there was increasing public and regulatory concern, in the 1950s, 60s and 70s. Uh, it's more recently been used for quantitative microbial risk assessment. And you'll see that reflected in the Australian Drinking Water Guidelines and the Recreational Water Guidelines. Now, there's no reason why um, risk assessment can't be applied to other physical hazards, uh, or for that matter, psychosocial um, hazards such as poverty and other factors that may affect um, the health of the public. 
So some of the reasons for risk assessment um, developing was that there was often a need to estimate risks at a point of time and also changes in risk over time. I mentioned the application to contaminated sites in the 1980s there are a range of highly publicised public sites, um, whether they were very local or even regional, such as Port Pirie or Broken Hill um, or the Hunter region, Cockle Creek. Banks found that they were using land as collateral for loans. Um, they were sometimes finding if they foreclosed on a land, um, if it was contaminated, it had a negative value. Uh, when some of these concerns arose, companies are also wanting to be able to assess their risks if they were buying or selling land. So that's why I talk about baseline risks. There were new types of risks becoming apparent as we were dealing with different um, chemicals of concern, whether it was the organochlorine pesticides in the 1990s or more recently PFAS. Uh, the different types of risks, so beyond straight chemical risks, um, became an issue. Uh, and it, we started to feel that we needed better ways of setting standards and having a defensible risk-based approach um, so it wasn't just the old good old boys around a table setting standards uh, highlighted the value of developing risk assessment methodologies. So it's not only standards, but also policy. As I mentioned before, it provides a greater degree of transparency and a record of um, public health risks uh, to help um, uh, argue the matter, whether it's in the court of public opinion or a court of law. It's also useful as a way of deconstructing and critically analysing questionable theories, methods and data. Uh, <clears throat> in 2003, um, we released um, these environmental health risk assessment guidelines. They were published by NHealth. They were uh, slightly updated and the second edition was published uh, in 2012. Uh, the NHealth model, which was directly um, based on the US National Academy of Sciences model, went through a four-step process of issues identification, uh, the, the hazard identification, so what is the agent we're concerned with, what's the dose-response relationship in relation to that agent or hazard, um, what's the level of exposure of an individual or more likely population or subpopulation, and you um, integrate all that information into a risk characterization um, so as better to understand the nature and magnitude of the risk. Now, in the 2003 uh, document, we set it out um, like this. Um, and I'll move on later to show you the latest iteration. Uh, but we perceived risk assessment as being an objective scientific process and the risk management being the more subjective process that not only takes into account the scientific information, but social, economic, and political information. Uh, 
we wanted to try and distinguish the two uh, and um, make sure people understood when they were using subjective elements. And there are subjective elements, for instance, in the choice of data or models or exposure defaults in the risk assessment process, or when you're moving to uh, the more subjective risk management issues. I'll talk later about um, clarifying what your role is. As a public health physician, you may be the risk assessor and the risk manager. You always need to be asking yourself, when are you being a risk assessor, when you're being a risk manager? A bit like cluster investigations, you really need to figure out who's doing the cluster assessment and who's doing the cluster management. And it might be different people with different objectives uh, and you need to be aware of what their objectives are. Now, this was the more recent iteration of the in-health uh, approach. Uh, and that um, it really looks at having three phases. Uh, I'd strongly recommend if you wanted to study and have a, uh, a risk assessment methodology that you look at um, page 11 of the in health guidelines. Um, I have written a long URL, but if you search in health publications and environmental health risk assessment, you should find this fairly readily. So it explains the processes. Uh, in the earlier iteration on this, uh, really an integral part for all phases is internal and external stakeholder uh, and engagement uh, and involvement. Uh, so that's really an important aspect. There's also that uh, review while you're doing it, that reality testing uh, of what you're doing both during and after uh, you conduct a risk assessment. So it distinguishes between risk assessment and risk management. It is one um, difference with the Standards Australia approach, which sees risk assessment as a subset of risk management. We really wanted, uh, from an in-health point of view, to have one leading to the other, uh, given that it might be done by other people. Even in this document, uh, you might see the uh, tendency towards uh, a chemical risk assessment. Um, you'll see that there's a term COPC for chemicals of public concern. But as I said earlier, you can apply it to any um, environmental hazard. And I use environment in a very broad term. Einstein used to say the environment's everything that isn't me. Um, this document, um, uh, in this table, there is only a brief mention of uncertainty. I think that's an important aspect of doing risk assessment, uh, and it's really quite important for the risk manager to understand. But I'd highly recommend you look at that um, diagram. So, before you even start a risk assessment, and sometimes you'll find you're told you've got to go and do a risk assessment, um, you need to think about some issues like, is a risk assessment appropriate? And in my next slide, I'll give you a situation where you don't really need to do much of a risk assessment. 
if the hazard or risk is politically or socially unacceptable, uh, you have to ask yourself if something such as a chemical is going to be banned or highly regulated, what's the value of doing a risk assessment? And always um, there is this question, is there a better way of managing the risk? Um, in uh, occupational medicine, uh, they talk about a hierarchy of management, you know, with banning a substance or a procedure at the top of the hierarchy. And then you can step down to things like substituting uh, a different chemical or procedure. Uh, so there are different ways of managing the risk. This is a classic photograph of people building skyscrapers in 1930s uh, America, and you don't need to do a risk assessment to appreciate um, the, a range of risk management options uh, are needed in the situation. So can you use, rather than having a full-blown risk assessment, which is time consuming uh, and quite resource intensive, can you rely on criteria uh, which are risk-based in their setting? And that was a, a process um, which we started using with uh, contaminated sites of trying to set criteria with wide margins of safety. Uh, we did call them health investigation criteria, suggesting that if you exceeded them, you needed to do further investigations um, to determine uh, what the nature and magnitude of the health risks were. In reality, once we'd introduced them, they started being used as a de facto uh, remediation criteria. So before you start doing a risk assessment, figure out what's already been done. Importantly, because it is time and resource intensive, um, is the time and resources available? And most particularly, who's the risk assessor and who's the risk manager? So even if you're doing both, you've got to figure out when you've got your risk assessment hat on and when you've got your risk manager uh, hat on. Often you find, unless people step through that, they end up with role confusions. And it becomes even more complex when you've got other parties who might have different objectives to you involved as perhaps the risk manager. So often it's really important if it's a multi-departmental or multi-party um, situation, to really ask or establish what the objectives of all the involved parties are. Um, sometimes they're not compatible with yours. We assume everybody is operating from a public health perspective. But as an example, I was involved in a major measles outbreak in a high school, and it took me some time to figure out the problem I was having with uh, coordinating some of the actions was the Department of Education had quite different objectives to what I had as a public health physician. For example, I wanted to close the school while we sorted out uh, the issues. Um, they wanted to keep it open. Um, it, it happened that I eventually found out that they'd had a previous school closure where a child had, uh, I think, drowned in a storm when the school was closed and children were sent home. Um, so that was affecting them. So 
often you find that they don't have objectives that neatly match uh, the objectives of public health. You've always got to ask yourself, is it being done as a ritual to satisfy political concerns rather than a meaningful process? Uh, because the process of risk assessment is really aimed at informing the risk manager, you've got to figure out uh, how you're going to communicate to the risk manager, but not only to the risk manager, uh, but also to the other parties involved, which can be the community uh, as a whole. I've been involved in some pretty complicated issues with uh, contaminated land, etc., where you've had quite fractured um, uh, uh, fractures occurring within the community. Also, you know, when you start talking about risk, different people will have different interpretations of what risk is and what some of the terms you use will mean. Uh, so communication is a challenging aspect. Sometimes, uh, and you may need to clarify this early on, is um, are you going to present your findings in a quantitative way um, so often as a number or a qualitative way, you know, as a category of risk? There are problems with both and often you're using quantitative aspects um, uh, particularly with regards to exposure, uh, but you're also using the qualitative aspects. I'm always a bit suspicious of risk assessments that are highly numerical, uh, and the more decimal places they have, uh, the more concerned I am about it. The numbers <clears throat> may rely on quite conservative defaults. Um, so it may be that they overstate the risk. There is always, depending on the choice, the possibility it might understate the risk too. Um, even with a quantitative methodology, if you regard it as just an indicator rather than an absolute measure of the risk, it can still be very useful to help rank the risks and say this risk is greater than that and, you know, we're going to get um, some or a lot of reduction in risks if we pursue this uh, remediation strategy. Um, if you are um, categorising uh, the risks, you really need to look at how you're going to categorise um, or define those categories to help uh, people understand. Uh, again, this is an example where uh, a precise value in quantitative risk assessment shouldn't be mistaken for accuracy, which it often is presented. Um, sometimes um, you've really got to use ordinary language to indicate the level of risk, uh, and having a well-defined ranking system can be useful, not only to yourself and the risk manager, but to the community. Terms such as high, medium and low risk, or negligible risk, or nugatory risk, uh, will be interpreted um, quite differently by different groups. So there's the whole field of risk perception and uh, as examples, you know, 
involuntary risks are less tolerated than voluntarily taken on risks. Um, people tend to accept uh, naturally occurring risks better than they accept anthropogenic risks. But using terms like high, medium and low can often lead to quite different uh, uh, perceptions uh, and confusions and pro problems with risk management. Um, there's always the risk of using inappropriate comparisons, which can be seen particularly by the community as not addressing their concern about a particular risk. Uh, you've got to always look at if you're um, undertaking some sort of remediation, what are the contingent risks from those remediation activities? You know, there have been lives lost in major earthworks as a, a related to remedying contaminated sites. So often it's not a, uh, we'll move from a risk to no risk, uh, even making that movement may entail risks and they may be different, albeit lesser risks after your um, remediating activities. You also, if you're starting off determining a level of risk, ask what's going to be acceptable or tolerable and um, to whom is it going to be acceptable or tolerable? Often you find when you start doing a risk assessment, you don't have enough data uh, and you might be too heavily reliant on default data. For example, looking at contaminated sites, um, the median exposure uh, for children under two is probably about 100 milligrams of, sorry, um, uh, 20 milligrams of soil per day, sorry, I'll correct that, 20 grams of soil per day. We work on a default of 100 grams of soil, but there may be some child with a um, soil eating behaviour that consume more than that. So when you choose a default number, you've always got to be aware of the uh, outliers there. Uh, a big part of doing risk assessment and risk management is having tr models that are transparent. They may be difficult to interpret, for instance, modelling uh, of air plumes. Uh, I myself rely very much on trusting people who are doing modelling. Um, but sometimes the mathematics are quite complex. When you come up with a risk estimate, um, you know, are you looking at uh, the best estimate of risk? And is it for the population as a whole or um, a particular subset of the population? Some methodologies um, come up with an upper end estimate. Uh, and sometimes these can be quite conservative. On the other hand, as I mentioned earlier, you don't want to underestimate the risk. Um, so is there a good appreciation of uncertainty? Um, because this may well come up um, uh, in your risk communication to either the risk manager or the community. Uh, and some people like Steve Harudi, uh, who's been involved in risk assessment for a long period of time, has said, you know, one of the main reasons for doing the risk assessment is just to help you identify the areas of uncertainties and the level of uncertainties, which might be an order of magnitude. You also uh, often 
will find it useful to do some uh, sensitivity analysis using different assumptions or data selections. In that first step, um, you know, you're figuring out what's the concern, why it's a concern. I'll skim through some of these fairly quickly. Uh, before you launch, you've got to figure out whether you're going to be able to have any impact from doing a risk assessment. Um, and uh, when you work through these stages that I mentioned before, the exposure assessment, the dose response, you come to the risk characterizations. So you're trying to summarize the key issues and conclusions. Uh, and importantly, you need to be aware of your overall strengths and limitations. Dealing with the uncertainty seems to be an issue that's overlooked with that standards of Australian methodology. And I found with the risk metrics, there's a lot of discussion about which boxes you choose. And the inaccuracies and imprecision, i.e. the uncertainties, aren't always adequately addressed. And that's been a criticism uh, of some of those who've critiqued the method. Admittedly, for people who have no real understanding of risk, um, and risk assessment, it helps them to start to uh, look at it uh, and start to think of it uh, in certain ways. But I think from a public health point of view, we're often dealing with greater complexity. So some of these more sophisticated methods are needed. So a, a measure of how good the assess the risk assessment is, is how well it's understood and is able to be acted upon by the risk manager, how successfully it advocates for appropriate risk uh, management. Uh, it's also important uh, to have it well written down because it can be a useful tool for your risk communication. So it's important that people understood or understand it, even though that can be challenging. Uh, you really need to look at the default values, assumptions and policy judgments. Uh, that are in it. Uh, you want to understand some of the aspects of this falls into the risk perception, uh, aspects of understanding the multiple dimensions of risk. Again, that's not very well dealt with uh, from my perspective and that standards Australia is aspect. You're often just looking at limited um, aspects of it, whereas risk is multi-dimensional and it's challenging, but the more dimensions you can capture, the more helpful it is to your risk management and risk communication. Um, you, before you're doing it, you, uh, you need to understand what others have done in terms of their risk characterization. So be aware of conflict or duplication uh, that may occur. Um, there are major problems, and I often use this example of communicating risk. This was the Challenger uh, lunar module, which uh, burnt up on re-entry because tiles had been damaged. Uh, Edward Tuft, who's very worth seeking out, uh, uses uh, the way some of the information was presented to the risk managers as being fairly problematic uh, for getting effective um, 
uh, risk management. He's particularly concerned about the use of PowerPoint slides. So if you uh, are interested in this, and it is quite interesting, look up the edwardtuft.com website and search for his cognitive style of PowerPoint or his appraisal of the challenger uh, tragedy. One key issue, and this is getting into the risk perception and risk communication aspect, is what exactly are the risk uh, assessors estimating? Is it actual calculated and perceived risk? The Society for Risk Analysis would say um, uncertainty is the difference between the actual and calculated risk. Uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, uh, it can be orders of magnitude difference. Sometimes it's a, a black box, uh, and this relates to the lack of transparency. I often uh, suggest some risk assessments are a bit like the way farmers weigh pigs uh, using a large bean balance, uh, going to a lot of trouble to balance it with large rocks and estimating uh, or guessing uh, the weight of the rocks. So having transparent methods uh, is really quite important to have it uh, done. In some of the more contentious issues I've dealt with, we found it useful to have independent scientific facilitators so they can um, uh, verify what we're saying, or for that matter, challenge us, or interpret the community's concerns so that we have had to address that. We used uh, an independent scientific facilitator to deal with uh, a situation where we had a major fire in a uh, pesticide packing um, facility um, where there are a whole range of issues including um, you know how do you model uh, clouds of contaminated um, smoke some techniques um, people find hard to understand even though they might be quite valid such as Monte Carlo ways of getting better understandings of what the distribution of exposures are in a community. So very helpful, but people will often think you're whitewashing it if you use it. Uh, I'll give very quickly some examples where this has sort of been what's been presented. And as you can see, it's all a bit meaningless and yet a, uh, a risk is being categorised as low risk. Um, so often the numerical ones go astray. Different people have different perceptions of terminology. Uh, I've often found that whilst we're um, stating that this is a low risk contaminated site, the fact that the community has seen people running around the site in moon suits uh, is a much more powerful message than what we're saying. And our way of addressing it is to explain these people are working on contaminated sites all the time. We take a very conservative approach. Uh, and that's why we're um, putting them in PPE. The problems have generally occurred when the community hasn't been warned beforehand and we got into the process of door knocking or letterboxing to say, you'll see people dressed in PPE tomorrow on such and such a site. Uh, and, and explaining it as I hope I've explained now. Uh, but if there's a, um, an apparent conflict between what you're saying and what it appears you or other government 
departments are doing it's problematic. Uh, some um, risk assessments don't really um, discuss how well the risk, uh, uh, over what time period you're applying this. Are you applying this to a financial year, a lifetime or forever? Uh, you will have seen with the recent floods how um, in a sense, misused the term one in a hundred year flood as implying that if we've had a flood this year, we might not have another for another hundred years rather than being a one in a hundred chance every year. So the terminology needs to be really quite um, closely looked at and sometimes um, having a concise and appropriately worded narrative, you know, a few sentences may be much more useful than any single word, such as high, unlikely, or number. Um, I'll just skim over, but there are issues with dose response. Uncertainty assessments are important. Uh, it's always present. Uh, and you need to look at uncertainties with each step of your risk assessment uh, process. Uh, I've only got a couple of slides to go. Uh, there was a discussion about in the competencies, understanding surveillance data in relation to environmental health risk assessment. It's a problematic area. I was involved many years ago about trying to develop environmental health indicators and getting validated indicators um, is problematic uh, given that we've in some ways improved things so much. Uh, but even at the current time, we're seeing issues with not being able to fully appreciate the air quality data. And for many years, I was involved in trying to get messages around air quality data, but it was very problematic working with different departments and states. Uh, and even in areas such as um, the drinking water guidelines and recreational water guidelines, some of these um, are strongly uh, risk-based, but uh, the interpretation of the data, like 95th percentile data in relation to recreational water, is very problematic often to both the users and the population. You know, it's many of the problems we get with communicable disease data is problematic with environmental health data. Uh, and often we're seeing the tip of the iceberg with our data. So um, it's an area worth um, looking at, um, getting better environmental health indicators, but we've seen how um, a conflict uh, generating even climate change areas are. So it's going to be an ongoing challenge to public health positions. I've given a few references um, here and a link to the in-health guidelines. Um, the ATSDR primer on health risk communication is now out of the press, but it has a very nice statement in relationship to risk communication. If we haven't gotten our message across, then we ought to assume that the fault is not with the receivers. Uh, there are numerous others who've written about risk assessment. David Vose uh, is one. Um, uh, Hass uh, Rosengerber's book in 
1999 about quantitative microbial risk assessment as a benchmark. Uh, the problem is sometimes it, it's um, coming up with numbers that are going to several decimal places. Uh, it's the best data we have. Some of it was done on healthy white uh, adult males too. So extrapolating some of the data is uh, problematic. Um, so that's my call. Rachel, I think, has been looking at um, comments or questions you might have. So Rachel, are you opening this up to the questions? Thanks, Andrew. Um, I haven't received any questions through the screen yet. Um, if anyone who's listening on the live, if you have any questions that you'd like Andrew to respond to, could you please type them in the webinar chat box or in the Q&A box? Um, if there aren't any questions, um, I'll talk to Rachel about circulating um, the talk, um, but I'd strongly um, recommend you look at that diagram on page 11 of the End Health Guidelines. Um, you'll find that it is a useful tool at answering some uh, examination questions maybe, or dealing with these issues which often um, take up a lot of time if you're working um, in a public health unit. It also helps give you a language uh, for dealing with your environmental scientists or environmental health officers. Um, I think we've just received one question now. Um, can you hear me okay? Andrew? Yeah. Um, so the question is, I've been trying to understand the AQI recently, often reported by the media. Is it a useful measure or is it better to look at PM 2.5 and other measures? Um, so you're referring to the air quality index and the PM 2.5. Look, this has been a contentious issue, as I said before, um, 10 or 15 years, we were having discussions at NHELP about how you could categorise that air quality data, which is sort of problematic in itself. Uh, different states have different ways of measuring it. Some states have their air monitors in areas that they thought were particularly bad near oil refineries or major highways. Um, so it was sometimes worst case data. Uh, in other uh, states, it was sort of in the CBD, which may not be representative um, of areas. Some of the issues are the timeliness um, of that data and how representative it is. You know, certainly in Sydney um, and Brisbane and here on the Sunshine Coast, uh, our air quality is not good. Uh, starting 15 years ago, there was increasing interest in uh, the, the microparticles or nanoparticles. Um, so initially we used to look at less than PM10, uh, so 10 microns, which um, particles of uh, above that size were not likely to get into the alveolar tissues. Um, ones less than that um, could, and then more recently, starting 15, 20 years ago, there was an increased interest in PM 2.5. So um, uh, this was of an aerodynamic um, a diameter of less than 2.5 microns. So they can penetrate um, um, the alveoli and uh, 
whilst some of the earlier data, I had problems with, you know, it was talking about causing miscarriages, uh, et cetera. Uh, it was not until about 15 years ago um, it became apparent these minute particles could be absorbed into the circulation. So uh, didn't just have a local um, effect on the lungs, but could have more meaningful levels. So coming back to your question, you want... The more information is always the better. If it's an air quality index, you need to look at exactly how that's defined. Uh, the PM 2.5 is of increasing interest and concern. Uh, I think we'll see um, a significant amount of um, uh, of hospitalizations and probably deaths with a long tail after the current episodes. It's a bit like um, heat waves. Um, we'll still have the problems of the adequacy of the measurements across large areas. And, and sometimes, you know, country areas where there might still be significant populations don't have any measurements. It's hard to set up measuring stations quickly. It's expensive. Uh, but, but it's really important and will probably become increasingly important. So um, it, it, it would be good to be able to have this data readily apparent. There's been another issue with surveillance even 20 years ago, the American Journal of Epidemiology was suggesting that practitioners stop doing time series analyses of the equivalent of AQIs. Um, uh, uh, because they were saying, we've got enough data to know that air pollution is not good for you. You should be putting your resources into just going out and fixing up the problem. Uh, an issue we've also got is comparisons about what makes up the cocktail of either the air in that air quality index or the PM 2.5, so that you can figure out ways of trying to affect it. Um, so it's a challenging area, but I'm glad you're interested, and I hope that's helped you a little. Um, Andrew, we've actually also got another question that's come through. So yeah. that background noise with me. Um, can you please comment on the role of the National Air Quality Standards in informing risk communication? That is, can the public be reassured about air quality when levels of pollutants are below these standards, or is this an, over, an oversimplification? I haven't reviewed them recently. At one stage, I used to represent the Australian Department of Health on some of these air quality standard setting approaches. Um, there are always limits, um, limitations with um, uh, standards, uh, but I can't give you a current appraisal, uh, but they are a, a risk management tool with all the impacts that you have um, related to standards, uh, you know, the risk managers, not just the risk assessors are involved. Um, uh, you, you know, having uh, the standards is better than not having standards. Uh, they need um, review uh, and timely review. Uh, often you find standards, once they're set, they're set in concrete uh, and um, it's very hard to change them. So in the field of asbestos, occupationally, um, there were standards set for asbestos fibres per cubic metre of air 
uh, back in the 1940s in the US. Uh, I'm sure it wasn't a cubic meter they used as the measurement tool, but they set in for standards, uh, which they were still arguing about into the 1970s. So it's, you need standards once they're set. It's often very hard to change them, particularly downwards. Um, so there is an issue. You might want to uh, try and appraise those standards and look at how they've been um, set. Um, you know, I was involved in some of the work around the drinking water standards and the recreational water standards. And th there is a lot of work that goes into them. With those standards, uh, there's a high degree of transparency about uh, it, but you can still quibble with the uh, quantitative microbial risk assessments, as an example. And often there is insufficient data uh, to um, give them millions of chemicals around, as an example. I hope that gives you some idea. I think that's great. Thank you, Andrew. Um, well, I can't see any last minute questions that have come through. So thank you very, very much for presenting this afternoon. I think it's been very informative to everyone who's joined. Um, I'm sure we'll have a lot of trainees who view the session later online. Yeah. Thank you very much, Rachel, and thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.